Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern-day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. In Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, Dr. Bernard answers your questions about what the Bible teaches and how those teachings apply to everyday life. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Several verses in the New Testament describe Jesus sitting or standing at God's right hand. Probably one of the most frequently re- referenced is Acts 7.55, where Stephen is being stoned and he looks up into heaven as he's, uh, as he's being martyred and he sees the, the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, if we take these verses at face value, don't they indicate some sort of separation or distinction between Jesus and God? I mean, after all, how can Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Father be one and the same if Stephen really saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God? This is a very common question, and it's a good question. So to answer it scripturally, there are a couple things we need to note first. First of all, Jesus Christ was a real human being in every way just like us except for sin. So the Bible, the New Testament particularly, does make a distinction between God and Jesus. It's not a distinction of two divine persons. There's only one God, and there's no distinction of persons in his eternal essence. Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And there are many other statements of the Bible. For example, in Isaiah, God says, I'm alone. There's none beside me. There's none like me. There's none before me. There's none after me. When I created the universe, I stretched forth the heavens alone. I spread the earth by myself. Uh, I will not give my glory to another. So the Bible is full of statements that God is one. However, Jesus was a real human being. So in order to protect the authentic, genuine humanity of Jesus, the New Testament speaks of the Father and the Son, or God and Jesus. And here is a classic example. So that's the first point I would like to make. The second point is that God is a spirit, John 4, 24. In fact, John 1, 18 says, no man has seen God at any time. Now, notice that statement was written after the incarnation, after the death, burial, resurrection, life, ascension of Jesus. So even after the disciples had seen Jesus for years, John was able to write, no one has seen God at any time. That's talking about God's spirit. So God as a spirit is invisible. So when you say Jesus is standing at the right hand of God or Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, You must understand it as a metaphor. You cannot understand it as a literal description of bodies. If you do, you have the question, how can you see God? God's a spirit. God's invisible. Um, Is Jesus sitting or is he standing? Or does he just change position every so often? Uh, It's been a couple thousand years since he ascended to heaven. Can he walk around or does he have to sit there? Um, you know, or maybe he's on the right hand. Maybe it's a giant right hand and he's standing on the right hand. You you can easily see this becomes absurd when you try to make it a physical positioning of bodies. Then also, if you have two different bodies, in what meaningful sense do you have one God? Any, Any normal person, if I showed you a picture of an old man and a young man, if that be the case, uh, sitting here, would they say, oh, there's one person? No, they would say, uh, you know, th- th- that's one God there. No, that's two. And then another question is, well, if, if there's a trinity, as, as this uh, discussion leads to, well, where's the third person? Is he absent? Um, so when you get to heaven, are you going to see an old man, a young man, and a dove? Uh, is the third person a, an animal? Uh, I, even even the in Revelation 5, it talks about the lamb. So is the second person actually going to be a man or is it going to be an animal? So when you try to interpret these verses in a physical sense, you quickly go to absurdity. So if God is a spirit, God is invisible, and God is omnipresent. Psalm 139 says God is everywhere. So where would God's right hand be? How, where would If Jesus, we do believe, has a physical body, even now he's in a glorified physical body somewhere transcending this universe. I think his spirit is everywhere, but 
he will come back to earth in his glorified body. We will actually see him. But if, if there is that one body of God, which God has chosen, well, where would be the right hand of God so that this body could go? Where would he go? I mean, is it, you know, on the earth or in heaven? So the point is we need to look at this as a metaphorical expression. And sure enough, in the languages of the Bible, both the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, there is a metaphor much like we have in English. When we say, this is my right-hand man, we say, this is the person that executes my will. This is the person that does most of my work. This is the person I rely on heavily. And and the reason is 90% of people are naturally right-handed. So instinctively, a right-handed person thinks of the right hand as having power. Uh, and if you are right-handed, of course, if you're left-handed, the opposite is true, but it's, the point is still there. When you try to write with your left hand or you try to throw with your left hand or you try to fight with your left hand, you quickly feel awkward. You can't get the job done. You feel foolish, weak, helpless. But if you can use your right hand, you feel strong. So that's why it's a metaphor. The right hand is the position of power and authority. And also in ancient times, the right hand position, like of a king, is the position of honor. If you sit at the right hand and you see this in the New Testament, then you're seated in the position of honor. So actually what we're saying is the visible man, Jesus, is at the right hand of the invisible spirit of God. In other words, the visible man, Jesus, has been invested with all the power and authority of the one true God. And why is that so important? Well, in in Christ's earthly ministry, he just appeared to be an ordinary man. Of course, to people with eyes of faith, they saw him do miracles. They heard him speak. They realized he's more than just a man. But just to the average person, he would look like a typical man. Uh, But after he ascended to heaven, he assumed the position of glory. So when Stephen was dying, he saw the glorified Christ He didn't just see him as an ordinary man walking around on earth. Uh, To draw the contrast, uh, the apostle John, on a human level, was a close friend of Jesus. So so close, he leaned up against his breast at the Last Supper. And when Jesus was talking about somebody is going to betray me, Peter reached over to John and said, ask him who he's talking about. Because John was at the closest position. And on a human level, you know, if anybody could get something out of Jesus, no doubt it would be John. Okay, so that's how close they were. But in Revelation chapter 1, when this same apostle John saw the ascended Christ, he fell down at his feet as if he were dead. He was so overwhelmed by the glory of God. Hey, what happened? You walked with him for three years. You ate lunch with him. You leaned up against him. It's no big deal. You're his his best friend. But now you see him and you just fall out because he saw him with the glory of God, the right-hand position. He, He saw him as God manifest in the flesh. So if you read uh, Acts 7 very carefully, it does not say Stephen, Stephen saw two bodies. It doesn't even say Stephen saw God and Stephen saw Jesus. It says Stephen saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So I would say Jesus uh, Stephen saw this cloud of glory which was a manifestation of God. You can't directly see God's invisible spirit, but God could reveal his glory as in the Old Testament. And then I, the way I picture it in the middle of this cloud of glory, I imagine Stephen looking up and he sees this cloud of glory, obviously the glory of God. But as he looks closely, he sees one man emerging out of it. And that's Jesus. He can recognize him. But it's not just Jesus as he appeared on earth. It's Jesus as God. And so how does he say it? I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. In other words, I see Jesus in the position of power. I see Jesus with all glory. Now, if he saw two bodies, you would have this violation. Somebody actually did see God. But then if you keep reading to the end of chapter 7, Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. If he saw two, he ignored one, and he prayed only to Jesus. So I'm persuaded that he saw one, and therefore he prayed to one. He spoke to one, and that one is Jesus. Now, if it seems a little far-fetched that I'm using this metaphor, actually, you say the whole Bible, 
you'll see the right hand is repeatedly used as such a metaphor. For example, Exodus 15 and 6, when the Israelites were rejoicing over the fact that God had delivered them from the Red Sea. Uh, Exodus 15, 6, they sang, Your right hand, O God, is glorious in power. Your right hand delivers from the enemy. Did a, a, a giant hand come out of heaven? If so, how do we know it wasn't the left hand? Did a giant hand come out and scoop them up? No, it's talking about the power of God. The Psalms, David said, the Lord is at my right hand. Did Jehovah have a physical body and he always walked around on David's right side? The Lord is at the right hand of the poor. Um, or Matthew 26, 64. Here's a great example from Jesus Christ himself. Well, he's on, he was on trial. He told the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the high priest, you're going to see the heavens open and the Son of Man coming at the right hand of power. So when Jesus comes back in the clouds, are we going to see two bodies up there with Jesus at the right hand of another body? No. What he was saying, you're going to see me, but you're going to see me not as I am here, your prisoner. You're going to see me coming at the right hand of power. In other words, you're going to see me coming with the glory of God. So Jesus himself interprets this. The right hand position is not talking about a position of two bodies. It's talking about a position of power. And this statement is used throughout scripture. In Hebrews, the right hand position may signify that he is our intercessor, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, he intercedes as a human uh, to God, as the high priest. But I think overall, the primary emphasis is to say that man, Jesus, is not just a man, but he has been invested with the power and authority and glory of God. In fact, it's revealing Jesus as God manifests in the flesh. So I would say Jesus standing on the right hand of God means Jesus, our mediator, Jesus, our representative, is actually the true God manifest in the flesh with all glory and power. So it's a powerful affirmation of the oneness of God and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share apostolic life in the 21st century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.